So um, next on our list will be a panel session. Um, I'm also, uh, I, I believe today is all, about, is all about software developers. We really want to help software developers to get into the global market and also help their productivity. So next we are going to be having a panel session that will be discussing on how to position yourself in a global market as a software developer. And to moderate this session is um, Chris Basolai. He is one of the program assistants that has been championing the GATS program. So I will hand over to Chris to introduce our panelists. Hello, Chris. Hi, Sam. Um, such a good end to uh, Lona's session. And I actually liked how you engaged her and uh, asked her those questions, uh, especially regarding how to be productive as a software developer. So, given that that was a good starter to all our sessions, um, I'd just like to start off by reminding people to tweet as we continue uh, with today's sessions. And um, if you can, um, even invite more of your friends to join in on the live stream because um, the upcoming sessions are actually going to be very productive to you uh, as a software developer. So for now, we're going to head into um, a panel session. And for this panel session, uh, we titled it uh, positioning yourself um, in the global market as a software developer. And it's because, um, as Joy very well said, uh, at this point, we are just not thinking about local. We want to actually go global um, and, and um, even work for these multinational companies and um, even bring our own solutions uh, to these big platforms. So um, with us, we have three very um, amazing guests, and I'm going to be introducing them in a few. Um, so. Um, I won't go much into their bio in the beginning because we want to actually hear about their journey today. Um, so I'm just going to, in, to introduce them and then um, give their job titles and then from there we'll continue. Uh, so first off, um, we have Juma Alan. Uh, so Juma is um, just a second. So Juma is a senior Android engineer currently at Backbase. Uh, we also have Abu Bakar Ango. Um, he's a developer uh, evangelism pro program manager at GitLab Inc. And lastly, we have Rihanna Kedir, uh, a software engineer consultant uh, and also a GDE. So um, I won't again get into their profiles too much because we actually want to hear about their journey, how they started off um, and all. So um, Abu Bakar and Rihanna, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Amazing. Um, well said, Juma, thank you. Perfect, Rihanna. Uh, thanks a lot for joining in. Um, Juma will be joining in a few. Uh, he's just getting settled. So um, the very first thing, of course, even before we continue, our learners definitely want to know about yourselves um, and your journey um, into software development and all. So giving us uh, some background to how you got into this industry and how it's going for you currently. So we'll start off with um, Abu Bakar and then head on over to Rihanna. Awesome, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I'm excited to be here and uh, I'm always uh, elated and uh, appreciative when called in to speak or contribute to community activities or events like this, coming from someone who grew in the community and also still in the community. Yeah, I'm from Iloring Kwara State in the uh, southwest Nigeria, but I've lived most of my life uh, in Jos and Bauchi in the northern part of Nigeria. Uh, I think almost like 30 of my 33 years on earth I've been lived in the north. Uh, yeah, and um, I started in the academia uh, working as the head of ICT in the, my al alma mater, which is Federal Polytechnic Bochim, from where I joined GitLab. Uh, and I've been with GitLab for the past four years and a couple of months. Uh, yeah, I'm currently based in the Netherlands, uh, moved to the Netherlands uh, early 2019, and I mostly work remotely from the Netherlands. Something interesting about me, uh, my Twitter handle is Serki247. 
Serki is uh, king in Hausa. Uh, and someone would think it's a king of something exciting, but during my school days, my one of our lecturers almost always catch me dozing off in the class. So one day he wanted to use an example, uh, do an example with my name. And he decided to go Abu Bakr Ango Sarki Bachi, that's king of sleep. So since then, I've uh, gotten used to using Sarki as part of my handles in a couple of places. Yeah, that's a short summary of me. Amazing, amazing. Thanks a lot for that very amazing introduction, Abu Bakr. Uh, later on, we'll go in depth into your um, journey within GitLab itself, starting off from a junior software engineer all the way to where, where you are now. Uh, but for now, I'd like to hand it over to Rihanna um, to give us uh, her story. Hi, everyone. So about me, well, um, I was born and uh, raised in, in Ethiopia. I'm from Ethiopia. Uh, for 10 years now, I'm living in, uh, in Italy, Rome. And um, fun thing about the, my journey into tech uh, is that uh, prior to being a, a software engineer, I was an accountant. And then afterwards, I worked also for, for years as a fashion designer, landing up uh, at the end at, uh, at a software career. And um, well, my journey it was uh, more of curiosity, actually. Uh, when I was growing up, I, have, uh, I had a limited uh, uh, computer and internet access back then, uh, but I was always curious about learning, the compu uh, learning about computers uh, and everything. I had a good job uh, and a well-paid uh, job as accountant. I was settling down, but then I wanted to pursue my dream and um, I decided after years to to just uh, start my bachelor degree in computer science and uh, started that's one that uh, started my bachelor in uh, in, in Rome uh, ten years ago. So now I'm taking ten for for ten years uh, and uh, I still design sometimes as uh, as passion, um, and I'm enjoying it. So that's that's my journey in general for getting into into tech. Amazing, amazing. Um, so it's actually quite interesting to hear that you went all the way from being an accountant. We lost you, Chris. <laughs> or at least I lost you. Yeah, I think we lost Chris. Uh, we can have uh, Juma Alan introduce himself as Chris joins back. Uh, hi everyone, um, sorry for being a few minutes late. Uh, my name is Joe Mylan. I'm currently working at Backbase as a senior engineer there. So uh, primarily I work as an Android engineer. Um, so what you do at Backbase is uh, we're building uh, banking platforms. Uh, so it's uh, digital banking, mobile apps, all those things. So that's uh, what I do at the moment. Um, four months already um, at Backbase and uh, so far so good. Okay, uh, thank you. I think we have Barcelai just connecting back. Uh, as Barcelai just connects back, yeah, he's here. Yeah. Barcelai just take over. Okay, um, apologies for that. Um, small technical hitches as it, as it always happens uh, during these events. Um, so, Juma, um, again, thanks a lot for joining in. Um, in the beginning, uh, we're actually giving our uh, developer journey stories into how we got into technology and basically um, how, how you have actually got into where you are right now. So maybe you can actually go ahead and give us your story. Okay, uh, so my story started way back in, um, I think early 20, no, sorry, late in 2015, early 2016. Uh, so at the time I was still in campus. Um, and then I think my, my journey into tech was a bit, it's a funny story, it started with a heartbreak. Uh, it's a famous story, most people know about it. Um, so since then, I've been uh, focusing uh, uh, on Android since my day one. Uh, along there, I picked up a couple of um, other things. Um, so late in uh, 2016, I started my first um, internship or consultancy in a company uh, that was uh, called Mover. That was 
in the same area as my school so i used to work um uh, part time and then part time as a student and then uh, i decided to stop uh, or rather quit school at that time uh, and focus on trying to become a better version of me uh so then the, so from 2016 i worked at mova for one year till end of 2017 and then uh, in 2018 i joined uh, trigger that was like my first full time job and then uh, still in 2017 before i joined trigger i was actually part of the first um we didn't used to call it gads at that time we used to call it alc so that was um, the first andela learning community that we had in kenya i joined in um, on the andre track and then i chose the intermediate level uh for me that was um very helpful in my career i i kind of like would, I, i would actually say that shaped up uh who i am today i got to learn a lot from so many people that i used to uh i mean learning in the peer groups um and then that opened up my networks and then um in 2018 um start of 2018 i joined trigger i worked at trigger for a year i left trigger to join delight uh i again worked at delight for a year i moved and then i went to branch uh, i worked at branch for two months and then due to covid i uh i took a break for like four months and then uh, at the moment like i mentioned when i was doing my intro i currently work at backbase so in all my uh past experiences i've been working with android um except at trigger i also doubled up as a backend engineer writing a uh, few things in go so if i'm not doing a bit of android i'm actually um writing some things in go so that's what i do uh when i'm not writing a lot of android code so that's that's uh more like my background in tech and what i've been doing and places i've uh, had a chance to work in great um that was a really amazing story and um i think i can definitely relate to the heartbreak part um and if people don't know about his story um please go and check it out uh, on his medium articles uh, i think he highlights uh, you know what that did and how it, it got him into um programming um but now also as you've noticed um if you can notice um all of our panelists today are big on community so that is why they actually fit to come into this kind of talk and talk about how you know um community also relates to you positioning yourself in a big way uh, in the general uh, tech ecosystem so going on to the next question uh, and given that um, learners have already heard about you know your interesting stories and entries into um into software development um each one of you has actually or is currently working you know with big global tech companies and you know that is no small feat for um a software developer you know coming from africa so um could you maybe share um how you actually got to get to this opportunity and stand out in such a way that they were actually uh, able to um um allow you to join their teams so again we'll start with abubakar and then head on over to riana and then juma ala Thank you very much. I think yeah to do justice to these questions I will have to start from 2001. Yeah that was when I kind of started getting comfortable with computers. Uh the first time I went to send an email from a cyber cafe and the interest has grown since then. Someone asked on the YouTube chat how I got to start as a head of ICT unit. Uh, as my first job it was i started programming uh uh right from the days of basic down to visual basic 6.0 and while in school during my nd national diploma days i shown that i can really build quite a lot of things doing most of the assignments in schools and so on so when the institution wanted to start uh, a new uh, department which is the MIS ICT directorate I was tapped to join in and I was given the employment right when I was still in school at HND Higher National Diploma so I started right from there 2010 and I kind of right from there till 2000 where uh yes I built webs site I the growth wasn't actually there any longer so i decided to start checking okay instead of being a local champion uh and claiming to be the guru that everyone 
think out of the box and get the more better opportunities uh, for myself. So I started checking online and uh, saw Automatic, the company behind uh, WordPress, because I was a very good user of WordPress. Then I decided to apply out of the blue, just let me see if I would get. And Matt Mullenweg himself replied me uh, saying, uh, uh, I should do more of open source contributions. That way I'll be able to uh, showcase what I know more and I'll be able to learn much more from contributions within the community. So that challenged me, uh, despite the fact I was rejected, but rejected with a very great advice. So I took it on and started applying to different companies. Uh, the first time I applied to GitLab as a front-end engineer, I was rejected. Then I saw a different role, uh, support engineer, which had to do with a lot of DevOps. And uh, I started losing interest in cloud and other things then. And around 2015, I started the Google Developer Group in uh, Bauchi, joined with a couple of amazing people, I think. Uh, Rachel Onoja, one of ALC uh, organizers then was also part of us. And right from there, I built myself up, up while also leading the community to be more strong with the cloud infrastructure, cloud uh, automation, DevOps, and so on. And I joined GitLab 2016, mid 2016 as a junior support engineer and grew to a full-time support engineer before transitioning early 2019 to a developer, uh, developer evangelism program manager, where I focus more on cloud native uh, uh, architecture and applications. And uh, I was able to even get certified as a Kubernetes certified administrator. I think the, the I remember when I was interviewing with uh, uh, the CEO of GitLab, uh, Sid, and the only thing he could say in my application then was, Mm, I might not be uh, the most ideal candidate for the job then, but I showed the zeal to learn, the zeal to grow, and that is enough for him uh, to be able to consent to uh, recruiting me then. So I think one of the things that made me to seek much more better opportunities, the fact that I recognize that I've played for more than six years doing the same thing, living in a community where I was not getting the challenges that I yearned and moving into the Google Developer Group community also opened my eyes to much more possibilities that are out there. And I decided instead of just claiming to myself that I know, and I decided to assume the box doesn't exist any longer, not even to think out of the box, and spend my wings high, not even applying to companies within Nigeria, but applying to companies outside the country. And uh, since then, it's been it's been seeking more challenges every day, so that I can go much more further. Yeah, I think that's basically how I got to this opportunity, showing that I'm ready to learn, focusing more on growing instead of looking to the world that I'm growing because that's. There's a huge difference between both. Appearing to the world that you're growing is quite different from actually growing. And one of the things most international companies look out for is, are you actually good or you, or you just appear to be good? Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Abubakar. Uh, that was a really interesting story, actually, you know, going all the way from being in academia and now working for a global company. So um, even as we go to the next person, I'd like uh, learners to actually listen in on the stories and see if there is a certain pattern uh, or certain specific things that actually make them succeed and uh, be able to join these companies. Uh, so Rihanna, over to you. Thank you. So uh, my story in working global companies, well, as I finished my bachelor degree in Rome, I was seeking for, uh, for companies uh, in Rome. And um, soon after I started working in, um, 
in a kind of a small company, uh, but they give me right away um, a permanent job. So I was really feeling happy and, and lucky to get that. But um, while I was working with them, I had this um, offer from them saying, okay, um, we like how you work. So we want to, uh, for, uh, we, want, we, will make, we want to make sure that you stay with us. And uh, I signed um, a five years contract saying that uh, I'm not leaving them or uh, they want to um, fire me. Uh, so back then I was really happy and I started uh, working um, in this company. After a year, after two years, I realized that this company was not uh, really making me grow professionally. Um, so I started to look around, but I have this constraint, so I cannot leave them. And the only way to leave them, it was uh, to uh, demonstrate that I was, uh, uh, let's say, good enough <laughs> to, uh, to chase other, other opportunities. Uh, and right then I started to join uh, different communities. Um, uh, I felt that I was really stretched in in this, uh, in this company um, and I wanted to grow. So I started to learn more uh, of uh, different uh, tech sectors. Um, uh, so mostly I was like learning other, other stuff and uh, I was getting certified by myself. Uh, and uh, then I started to uh, be part of also of the Google Developers Group uh, and I, I became a leader. So uh, mostly through community, I, I understood that I can, uh, I can search for uh, much bigger opportunities uh, as a blogger said. <laughs> and, um, uh, and then I started to, uh, to contribute more. So most of my time were uh, a, a part of work it was on, uh, um, on contributing to communities, organizing tech, um, tech conferences, and learning, learning with others uh, and other active me members of the community. So I, start, I started to build the confidence in order to search for other opportunities. Soon after, I realized that about the Google Developers uh, uh, Expert Program. Uh, so I started to work on what is needed to become a GDE and uh, uh, I became a GD. As I became a GD, it was enough to demonstrate to, to the company that I was working in, that I was, uh, um, that I can reach other other opportunities. So I left. I left that company and I started to work for for uh, another company, another uh, nationally. I mean, uh, a good national. Uh, um, Italian company. So I was working there and at the same time I was traveling a lot uh, uh, to conferences, uh, giving speak, uh, speaks in different, uh, uh, in different international conferences and that uh, broadened my network obviously. And uh, at that point, uh, companies were looking for me. I was not looking anymore for, for companies to work for, but uh, I had like different opportunities, uh, um, different um, a job offering coming to me saying, would you like to work here or would you like to work there? So my network gets uh, got a bit broadened and uh, I, could, I, could, I, I reached to the point that I can choose now the company that I can work for. And uh, during the COVID pandemic, uh, actually I was, I was uh, thinking of moving from Italy and uh, trying to chase other, other opportunities uh, somewhere else. But COVID uh, <laughs> happened and everything was closed. And at that time, I felt like I was uh, I was uh, a bit stretched in, and um, I started to look around. And soon after, I found uh, another interesting uh, and challenging opportunity. So uh, I uh, felt for that opportunity, and I got uh, this job. And currently, I'm working as a software engineer consultant at the United Nations World Food Program. It's well, it is. Uh, nice experience it's three months that i'm working here so yeah that's uh, how i try to chase um, challenges and uh, opportunities and uh, reach at a point that uh, now i can say that i'm try. i, I mean I'm, I'm working in a company that is international great um <clears throat> really fascinating actually hearing your story and one thing I know uh, about you is the fact that, you know, um, there are so many people, especially in community, given the fact that you are a GDE, who look up to you, uh, especially as a lady, you know, who actually got from where you are 
uh, and all the way to where you are right now. And I think the one interesting thing that I've had is, you know, you signing a five-year contract with a company and then, you know, having to know uh, how you can actually chase for something else uh, even within that um, even within that space. Uh, but it's very interesting hearing your story, Rihanna. Uh, for now, we'll jump on over to Juma. Uh, Juma, you can tell us your story. Okay, um, so for me, uh, I'd say I've been a big beneficiary of the community so far. So uh, my first job at Trigger, I actually got that through um, the Nairobi GDG event. That was in September, 2017. Uh, so I actually attended uh, the GDG event and then uh, I came in actually as an, someone, like an audience or something. And then I jumped into this session that was led by Frank and Seth. So Seth happened to work at Trigger. And then uh, I remember at that time they were doing a session about intro to Kotlin. So Kotlin was uh, relatively new at that time. Um, and then uh, they kept on asking questions to the audience and they kept on answering the questions that they were asking. Uh, and at the end of the session, Seth uh, actually reached out to me and he was like, uh, so are you looking for an opportunity? We might be uh, looking for guys to join our team. So um, just by, I mean, being uh, um, an attendee at a community, at an event, uh, I got a chance to join Trigger. And then uh, when I joined Trigger, um, at that time I used to be, so I think that that's the time we're actually finishing up the ALC program that was in uh, early 2018. And then, um, so during my time at um, the ALC program, I used to be a bit proactive. So I used to um, reach out to people, help people in the stack. And then uh, I got a chance uh, to get featured by the program. Uh, so Google did a video about my uh, my journey in tech. And then um, after that, um, while, while I was still working in Trigger, I started working on open source um, stuff. So I started working on M-Pesa projects. Um, and then at that time, Trigger was actually rebuilding most of the platforms. So I also got a chance to start working on the internal payment system uh, because I was already working with a few things on M-Pesa. And then uh, Safaricom also did a video and a feature about uh, what you're building using M-Pesa. Uh, so I got that publicity, and then um, that was uh, later in the year, in, I think towards the end of 2018. Uh, and me getting a job at Delight now was as a result of that, being proactive in uh, these community things and being um, featured out there for whatever it is that I was doing. So I actually got a call, and they're like, uh, we're looking for a guy to come in, um, fill in this position. And um, I mean, after a few, after one meeting actually, and a few phone calls, I decided to join uh, a Delight. And then uh, during my time at Delight, um, that was in 2019, uh, during the Dreadcom, that was in August, I actually met uh, Rob from Branch. So yeah, so, so Branch has an engineering team that sits in SF. And um, Rob was coming into Nairobi for, I think they were doing some integrations with the local bank. So, so he's coming, uh, he was coming to do like a physical meet and stuff. And then uh, we met during the event, we talked, and I, I told him I, I was actually interested in joining branch. And that's how the conversation started. So I interviewed there for like five months uh, while I was working at Delight. And then um, I got my offer early in December, and then I joined them in Feb. And uh, I think the thing about my uh, experiences so far is uh, I think communities have really opened up opportunities for me. Uh, being proactive in, uh, I mean, um, either tech talks or uh, being there or supporting communities doing talks all these things create a portfolio for you and there are people out there who are looking for people like you that's how people recognize you have talent that's how people know about you and uh it's the same thing with rihanna now opportunities start coming to you don't you don't have to struggle so much to look for opportunities out there they start you start getting opportunities and then you're like uh i don't want this i want this and then um the other thing is I think uh, even with that, it, it's really helped me to uh, push myself every day um, to become like a better version of me because, I mean, no one is no one is perfect still. I'd say I still fail in a couple. I've, I've tried to, so so when I left branch in uh, March, end of March, uh, till date, I actually, I've actually done 22 interviews. Many people don't know that. And I've failed so many of those interviews. But the thing that keeps me going is uh, for every failure, there's a lesson. That means there's something you don't know and there's something you need to learn. And for me, um, so when people say like things work out for you, I'd say people actually work hard to get there. So never be demotivated and feel like uh, I, I applied for two jobs. I didn't get eight of them. People actually do 22 interviews and fail like over three quarter of them. And then, so, it, and it's part of life and that's how you learn and that's how you grow. So for me, I feel like um, 
communities have really been a, a, a great help for me career-wise. They've really helped me um, uh, shape up who I am, get many opportunities. And then by that, it's it kind of like you many me the, the, the confidence to like uh, approach like these big tech opportunities that you feel that like they're not good enough for you. So uh, my advice would be, um, I mean, it all, it all begins with a, like one step and uh, there's, no, there's no rocket science. So the only thing you need to have is like patience and a lot of practice. So no one becomes a rock star in like a week. Everyone who has spoken, they, they tell you about the experiences they've been, um, how they started off as a beginner, how they got rejected, but that doesn't stop them from uh, trying to learn more and trying to uh, become a better version of themselves. Wow, wow. Uh, quite an amazing story, actually, Juma. Alan, um, Juma is one of our biggest success stories for the Andala learning community, and you can actually hear how it played a role in, you know, the rest of his journey just from where he started off to where he is right now. And maybe just to highlight a few things that have maybe, um, you know, that I've had consistently throughout all of your stories. Um, first of all is the fact that, you know, uh, reje rejections are a part of the story. And we've had, you know, from um, Juma, Rihanna, and Abu Bakr, you know, from, for all of them, there are always rejections as part of their journey, but, you know, you always have to still be resilient, um, go for what you want. And I believe also, you know, um, Abu Bakr actually stressed on this a lot, uh, you know, him getting hired was because of mostly passion, uh, because, you know, they could actually see the zeal to learn and the zeal to grow. So those are very important, especially when you're um, pursuing your journey. And maybe just to get very short answers uh, from each one of you, um, what do you think, you know, going for these opportunities that you actually went for? What do you think made you stand out from all the rest? Why you, um, as Abu Bakr or Rihanna or Juma Alan, and why not any other uh, person around what actually was that one thing uh, or two if so um, that actually made you stand out so again we'll start from Abu Bakr uh, I think one being prepared uh, they said uh, uh, opportunity comes both once but actually it's opportunity comes when you're prepared when it comes around you're prepared you're able to grab it better and also uh, not getting too comfortable uh, with your current knowledge, getting more. It will show when you are being interviewed or in your work that this person is actually learning and evolving. Uh, great, uh, Rihanna. Yeah, I think, uh... You, I mean, learning to go out from the comfort zone, it's, um, it's really important. So yeah, stretch out, see, um, see how to grab opportunities when they come and if they are for you, I mean, if they work for you and uh, don't, don't, give, don't ever give up. So mostly, I mean, my, uh, my experience, it was, uh, okay, I, I want to learn something new. I want to be curious. I want to be passionate at, in, 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 um, uh, when I'm working, I, I mean, um, I want to have passion of, for, for the work that I'm doing. So um, curious, being curious is really, is really a good help. And uh, a part of that is um, don't, I mean, don't be uh, happy with what you have, but try to, uh, I mean, you have to be happy with what you have. <laughs> That's not said correctly. But <laughs> um, how you call how you said don't be like um dream big and go out <laughs> of your comfort zone to to see what you can have more <laughs> amazing amazing thanks a lot rihanna so go to the comfort zone go for actually you know that big post that you've always wanted um juma alan yeah for me it's, it's um the confidence and the willingness to uh, learn for being open uh so and the second but I mentioned is um, so the willingness to learn uh, means that uh, if you don't know anything or if you don't know that specific thing that you're being asked, it's it's okay not to know, and it's okay to say that you don't know and you're willing to learn. So for me, I think I think those things have really um, helped drive, uh, or rather, they worked in my favor. 
just to show that you're open and you're willing to explore new things, you're willing to learn and uh, you're open, I mean, to, to ideas from the team and all that. That would be it for me. Great, uh, amazing. So um, very three key things that you've, uh, you've had from our panelists today uh, in terms of how you can actually make yourself stand out as a software developer. So now um, we'll just ask you know, um, specific questions to specific um, panelists and even just round questions to, um, um, to all of the panelists. Um, so starting off with uh, one of the questions asked by our learners. Um, so this is directed to Juma Alan. Um, one learner is asking, what is your work schedule uh, on a day-to-day? -day? Um, so the way I normally say it is, uh, I think my, <laughs> so, so my, work, my work is, um, I don't consider work work because if I do that, that means I'll be working like from eight to five. I consider my work, my, my life, my hobby. It's, I mean, it's kind of like part of me. So uh, normally I'd wake up at like 10 in the morning uh, uh, that's a bit late. Uh, probably, uh, so the company I'm working in at the moment, my daily stand-up will be at like 11.45 in the morning. So between waking up and my first stand-up, it's probably having breakfast or just trying to, I mean, uh, get up to speed with whatever it is I was doing uh, the previous day. So I'd start working from uh, that time and then I'll work up to like four in the morning. So I normally don't have any specific work schedule to kind of like follow. For me, I, I kind of like just have it uh, unplanned. And then uh, the only things I need to uh, think about is my calls. So if I were meeting at like three, I need to be ready for that. But then uh, uh, I'll be, I mean, just just not considering work work, that gives me the flexibility to even uh, be able to work up like four in the morning and be comfortable about it. And that has worked for me uh, all along. So I consider my work, my life and it's fun and it's what I love doing. So. There's no schedule that, uh, that I would say after five, I'm not working, I'm, I'll be doing this. So it's normally like that. It's just unplanned. Wow. So um, what you're saying is you're not tied in by, let's say, things like company stand-ups, you know, because you have to have set meetings no. during the day. None. Uh, so the, the work calls are the only things I need to plan for in a day. But uh, in, in terms of when, I mean, the time that I need to actually work, because most companies will say it's between eight and five. That doesn't limit me. So, so consider it uh, just unplanned. So if I feel like uh, I need to work on this at this specific time, I'll do that. But then uh, most companies actually work in like two weeks cycles or sprints. So depending on how much work you have, you'll be able to now think about, um, I'll be able to work on this huge chunk over the weekend. So you actually, you'd actually find me working uh, over the weekend. So say today in the evening, I'll be working on um, some features that I need to have them done by Monday. So for me, I feel like um, I don't like, I, I don't like to have like a very rigid structure about this is what I need to do. I kind of like let it be unplanned. I think for every person listening in, you know, that is like the it life for a software developer. So <laughs> I think that is definitely the upside, you know, you have flexibility of most of your day um and yeah you, you basically you're the one who says hey this is the time i actually want to work on a specific thing um and even as we continue um, asking the questions to our panelists today um i'd encourage everyone to um, post their questions on slido this is the one opportunity you actually have you know to ask a direct question to either Bubaka, rihanna or juma alan um so if you can please ask questions on that um and then you, we can be able to relay to the speakers um, going to the next question, and I will um, pose this to both Rihanna and Ango. Um, so, Roderick is asking, how does one contribute to open source? So, we'll start with Rihanna and then um, Ango. Uh, well, open source, uh, I, I mean, once you are spotted, what's your um, interest or a, a particular project that you want to contribute? You just, uh, you just, go for it. I don't have like a, um, a specific suggestion for this one. I just bounce from one to other based on what is my interest and what really I think it makes a change, right? So it's just more or less sharing and at the same time uh, uh, doing it in a way that is helpful also for the others. So I just take it like this in, uh, in, uh, in general. Yeah. 
to chime in here, I think the, uh, the open source community needs everybody from people uh, who just do editing or just, even I was listening to uh, a podcast uh, being hosted by Bridget Cromholt. She's one of the maintainers of Helm, a project used in the Kubernetes. And she said some of the most appreciated contributions are those people that fix typos, fix grammatical expressions and so on. So everyone is always welcome to open source. The only thing is to select projects that you are comfortable with and you, uh, you are willing to learn more in, not just to collect accolades that, yeah, this, I'm an open source uh, contributor, but put your passion in it and put the willingness to learn and evolve and the willingness to take feedback because it's the general world. Some people are empathetic, some people are less empathetic. So being uh, able to take feedback is also one major thing and not take things personal. I once watched a video of uh, Hillary Clinton where she said, take feedback seriously, but not personally. It's one of the major things you need when contributing to open source. They know how to use platforms for hosting open source like uh, uh, GitHub, GitLab, and so on. Know your way around them and learn Git. Just basics, you will evolve as, you don't have to be an expert. You will evolve as you contribute more. Um, I, very interesting, actually. Um, from one thing I've heard from both of you is, you know, find something you're passionate in, contribute to it. And given that it's um, Hacktoberfest, which is, you know, today is the last uh, day, if you can, please go and make contributions on GitHub and probably might lend yourself some cool prizes from them. Uh, and um, I think the one also other thing is um, I've been seeing going around is people making, you know, um, very interesting uh, pull requests. Um, but as long as you have quality uh, pull requests and contributions to these projects, then definitely they are going to um, notice you and um you know that might lead to something better so um the next question i'll pose this to rihanna uh since rihanna is a gde so um to other learners who also aspire to you know get to that, that same level um what are some of the key things they need to they need to know you know on the journey to become a gd becoming a gd well for for the journey um i mean uh, honestly speaking for my side when I got um, to the point to say, okay, I can apply for, I was not so sure that I was ready for actually. But uh, um, one of the things that really helped me is the fact that I was contributing to the community in general. I had um, a good uh, background in, um, uh, in the contribution. So that was a really, the key. Uh, I think that was the key to, 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 uh, to be able to ask, uh, first of all, uh, I mean, to compile the form to become a GD. So mostly it's that your contribution. A contribution could be from an open source contribution to writing articles, um, uh, doing demos, doing uh, uh, public speaking, uh, um, or mentoring, volunteering. Uh, every, everyone is different in a way that they contribute. So uh, mostly the contribution is one of the things that really helped me to reach to the, uh, to become a GD. And the other thing is uh, uh, spotting out which, which cat in which category you want to be, uh, you want to be a GD and uh, learning as much as possible in that, cat in that category. So uh, mostly, uh, Oh, I mean, you need have you need to have the technical uh, um, uh, skills from for the category that you are applying. So it could be Android, Web, uh, Flutter, Go, uh, Cloud, uh, or the other categories. Kotlin. Uh, I don't remember all the categories right now. So one of the things that was key for becoming GD is the love of contribution and being passionate in the technology that you want to become a GD for. So that's what worked mostly. And uh, when I was doing all these things, I didn't aim to do it to become a GD. I was just doing it uh, for myself, actually. So that helped me grow myself uh, personally and also uh, technically. And at, and at that point, when I reached to the point, I said, OK, let's try to be a GD, I was thinking like, okay, maybe my technical skill is not enough. Maybe I don't contribute that much or uh, any doubts that I was having. 
But um, what helped me, it's uh, uh, doing the things without thinking that I'm going to be a GD. I just tried that and <laughs> it happened. And uh, But I was doing it for five years, four years. I don't have a count of uh, how many uh, in how many communities I, I volunteered or I mentored. Um, so mostly, I mean, to become a GD, you, you have to be passionate of the, of the technology and you have to be passionate also on contributing in whichever way you are doing it. So it could be that you have um, thousands of followers, but it could be also you write a nice article and that is a good uh, um, is a good enough to become a GD. So, I mean, ev every GD has its own experience for me I was just doing what I loved to do and then I applied for that and I became a GD actually I'm a GD for three technologies uh, for uh, web uh, flutter and art <laughs> so it just came to me based on what I was doing but I was I was loving what I'm doing so basically um, I don't I don't know if uh, to give like um, uh, su suggestions to follow so in general, my, my journey to become a GD was like doing what I love to do, contributing, teaching others, but at the same time that was helping me grow and, uh, and being passionate of the things that I, ask, that I became a GD now. So you had it, that is the ultimate um, cheat sheet to becoming a GDE. Uh, definitely, you've had a lot of community, community contributions, um, and also experience in whatever you're doing. So if you're on the journey to that, um, you're definitely, you've definitely started off good with being in guards, and then just continue, um, you know, working that up to becoming that, and all the best to the people who actually want to get there. Um, so the next question I think I'll pose to each one of you. Um, so they've had you talking a lot about communities, you know, um, I did... Uh, this in this community, I did that in that community. But what are these communities? Um, so if you can, um, if you have some suggestions of uh, communities that developers can join, maybe you can, uh, we can actually hear from you. Um, we can start off with Juma Alan, uh, Rihanna, and then Ango. So yeah, um, so I think um, if we have uh, campus students who are part of the call, uh, the first community that you need to uh, be part of is uh, the developer student club. So that's, I think that's replacing the GDGs. I'm not sure. It's going to be corrected. But uh, so the, the DSCs are local um, uh, chapters in the, com in the universities that are actually um, specifically tailored for um, students. And then they're supported by Google. So uh, being part of the DSC comes with its advantages. And then uh, most, most of the DSCs are actually are structured differently. So you have like a mobile track, a web track, AI, ML, different technologies. So that's the first uh, level of community that should be part of. And then uh, depending on your special ed, the area of the special ed, the area that you specialize in, sorry, uh, we have a couple of co uh, communities out there that you can join. So an example is uh, for the Android um, lovers in the session today, we have Android 254, which is like the biggest Android community you have around. For people who love Go, we have Nairobi Gophers, which I happen to lead. Uh, for web guys, I know there's, we have JavaScript communities, we have um, Python communities, and most of these communities actually have um, like meetup pages on meetup. So you can actually uh, sign up to join one of them. And then uh, most of them actually in Nairobi normally have like a monthly meetup. I'm not sure about uh, most communities out there, but I feel it's generally the same thing. So I love like physical meetups where someone is coming and talking about something. So so that's the first step, joining in. And then uh, the second step for you will be, uh, no one is a pro. So if you're like a university student, the first place for you to like start uh, engaging in communities better is uh, to try and do a simple session. It could be an hello world, an intro to uh, ABCD. And then uh, that gives you the confidence, it builds you up and then probably by the, time you're doing your fifth talk, you're actually now doing that in your local um, larger community, like Android 254, you're coming here to talk about a specific technolo technology that you've been learning and working with. So I'd say um, on Meetup, you have um, so many Meetups out there, so many communities, depending on different technologies. And then uh, most of them actually have WhatsApp groups. Um, and uh, being part of like this bigger community that we are at the moment, uh, you actually get, you, you get the chance to network with like so many people I know which communities they're part of and then 
um that's that's like the first step and then now uh, uh, the other one is the initiative from you to uh, like pick one and join and become an active member not not just join and become passive just join and become an active member uh perfect perfect so those are some communities uh suggested by juma uh let's hear from rihana well by my side based on uh, what is your interest you check out the local communities but also the international communities and once you support that you just um, try to attend to the events to the meetups and see if it works for you because it depends I, I still repeat that it depends on what you are interested in and what you are you want to learn. And uh, once you spotted that, it could be web okay, you go to the uh, JavaScript meetups, uh, local meetups, or you join the um, groups on social you know, on social networks. Obviously, based on where you are, you just go around to see uh, the local uh, meetups uh, that can be done in person, and uh, at the same time also the international. Uh, uh, meetups and uh, once you spotted that you just try to be active uh, as uh, Juma said it's not only just go in there and participate in do that and uh, also at the same time try to propose some uh, some talks uh, uh, or either propose ideas uh, for me one of the first uh, uh, community that I joined is the Google developers group that now I'm one of the leaders also and uh, as I wished, there was uh, this study jam for Android. So I joined that and, at, and there I met uh, friends that I met uh, people that were doing the same journey of mine. And I started to uh, build a group with which I do some kind of uh, projects or still talk uh, to each other about tech, uh, our, uh, tech topics and, uh, and um, general topics. So yeah, be an active member of the uh, uh, of the community that you are uh, attending and at the same time try to build network also with the other people that are attending uh, or are member of the community so try to uh, gain as much as possible of each community once you understand that that community is what you are looking for and that will create a conference zone where you can go and talk about uh, any uh, general topic or technical topic and share ideas and also try to find also others that the community will facilitate you to, to find people that have the same interests and you can try to also work, for example, in a simple project or fix goals or share ideas and work on that. So networking is important, attending networking and don't underestimate the importance of networking that you can get from community members. That's my general suggestion. Amazing, amazing. So, um, you know, get into communities and then also uh, from you being in community, um, you get to interact with a lot of people and have a lot of networks. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Rihanna. And uh, finally, Abu Bakar. Yeah, uh, Juma and Rihanna have made very awesome contributions about uh, some of the communities you can join. I, I one, thing, uh, one thing I will add is... Uh, most of us sometimes can get meet up or community fatigue. Uh, that's where you've been attending uh, meetups or kind of getting bored. So I, I would say you can put more excitement or challenge yourself more, like Juma mentioned earlier, that if you love the technology or you are passionate about the technology, you can take it further by actually joining the uh, maintainer or the uh, contributors community of uh, that particular project. It might, be, it might look daunting at first, but that way you can see where the technology you are using uh, happens. They will invite you to the agendas of the meetings they are having. And you can see all the people that you hold in high esteem and you look up to within those community and you can actually DM them and they reply. So that way you'll be able to level up much more faster and in turn be able to contribute back to the local communities that you belong to. Uh, it's, I, I think one of the, uh, the joy I have in I'm a member of the Kubernetes community and the Cloud Native Contributing Foundation community. And I was kind of elated when the, uh, one of the major contributors, which is uh, Chris 
I've forgotten his full name, who is the VP of uh, CNCF, the CTO of CNCF, reached out to me about something that he felt I can contribute. I was like, wow, me being asked to do this by someone who is huge within the community will give you more boost and make you level up much more faster. And like Rihanna mentioned, it's within these communities that people can see the contributions you are making. They can see that you have been making impact in certain areas and you can easily get called on or asked to even positions or some people wonder how some people get into some very huge positions or some big companies. It's within these kind of communities that people see what you can do, that they can easily pick you or tap on you to come and do something that would have been out of your wildest imagination. Amazing, amazing. Um, definitely learners are learning um, a lot from, from you know, these sessions and even uh, GADS alumni. Um, and um, as, you know, our panelists have said, please go ahead and join those um, communities. And, you know, in no time, you'll actually realize that you're expanding your networks and opportunities will come by themselves. So we have a lot of questions trickling in from for our learners. And since we have, um, you know, 10 minutes and some change to go, um, I'll be asking these questions and then maybe we can be giving, you know, quick responses, maybe, you know, for some of them in a minute or some of them keeping them brief. Uh, so throwing this to Juma. Um, so Robert is asking, uh, Juma, based on your experience, will a beginner who just completed uh, GADS 2020 be able to get a job in any company? I'd say yes, depending on how. Uh, so, so two things uh, that most companies will look out for. Um, number one is your willingness to learn. And then number two, what skills are you bringing in? Um, so the way I normally tell people is uh, the GADS program alone is not enough to make you a rock star, but it gives you that um, floor to actually uh, become a rock star if you want to. Uh, so if you're in this program for like four months, you actually get to meet people at different um, skill levels. You learn a lot from them. And if you're actually putting in the time, by the time you're done with that program, you actually have some skills and some projects to show. And then uh, that becomes your portfolio because, I mean, that's like your first job. So if you're actually serious about the GATS program, you have something to show that you got from this program, then I'd say, yes, you have a couple of opportunities for people like that. Because most companies would actually look at this person and say, if you're able to learn all this and do this in like a span of four months, so if you give you an opportunity, you feel you're ready to deliver. So yeah, there are endless opportunities for that. Amazing, amazing. Uh, so definitely, you know, tips from Juma uh, on how you can, you know, transition from being a guards learner to actually um, getting, you know, something, something um, official to do. So I'm um, heading over to the next question. I will pose this to um, Ango and Rihanna. So um, a question, Alana is asking, Bronson is asking, what would you recommend uh, sticking to one language for longer periods of time or actually trying out a variety? So we'll start with Rihanna and then head on over to Ango. Well, for, for my experience or as, uh, as a curious person, I prefer to check around the other language in general. Um, I mean, it depends, but uh, it's good to know the other, um, where is the tech, I mean, that, um, the ten trends of the technology, the language and everything based on what you are aiming to, to work on. So um, my, my suggestion is don't stick to one language, try to understand others, even if you are not working in it, but just to have a, a general insight of what other, uh, other uh, languages are, uh, programming languages or technologies in general or platforms are available. And uh, bouncing around really, uh, I think it helps because once you, see, once you learn one language and then you are working on that to learn another programming language, the more you do it, the less time you take to uh, say, uh, adapt, adapt yourself to new technology, to new updates and platforms. So I say, yeah, have a good language that you feel comfortable with, uh, the programming language, but look around because trends can change and uh, updates are needed, especially in our jobs. So looking around, it's really helpful. Yeah, if I'm coming here, I would say, I think uh, you should focus more on learning programming itself 
then have great depth in, uh, like Rihanna said, in a particular language that will make you explore all the different possibilities uh, that is obtainable in programming. Then I really say you should have some kind of working knowledge on almost any programming language that you can get your hands on uh, so that at least you can, whenever an opportunity or a task comes in any of those languages, it will be easier for you to just dive in and Google is always your friend. You can search the documentations and uh, uh, check things to get what you need done done. But try as much as possible to have one, two, or three that you have great depth in. Then explore as many programming languages as you want, even if it is at just knowing a few things. But if you have very deep programming knowledge, not just the language, you'll be able to dabble into almost any programming language after a couple of hours of reading the documentation. Amazing, amazing. I think that is one of the you know dilemmas for any programming uh, enthusiast. Um, so posing this to Rihanna, um, how do you overcome any difficulty that you face, and what keeps you going? You know, in your day to day. Well, I think I learned by now that uh, failure is okay. <laughs> Actually, failure can teach you, and um, so to never give up if. That if I have a settled a goal and I want to reach there, I just work for that, and uh, that's what keeps me going in general. I don't. Uh, I mean, sometimes I feel fa I I see failures as a way to learn more, and uh, so I I'm okay with everything that comes, and then I just jump in and see. Uh, that's always trying to understand why why uh, what is my goal and uh, what I really want to 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 do so generally that's what keeps me going great great uh, thanks a lot Rihanna uh, and then um, directing this to Ango um, on the issue of experience so how can one actually tackle uh, the fact that many recruiters um, the feedback that you get from many recruiters is that uh, we are looking for a more experienced person how can I actually tackle um, that kind of dilemma yeah, I think one very great way of tackling that is contributing to open source. Contributing to open source gives you the experience of being able to put something out there that everyone can see, especially to, and you've been mentored by some of the best of the best in the industry. So no one will see someone who is very good at what they do, even if they only have one year experience, and say they prefer another person that's probably mediocre with five, 10 years experience. The main goal is to get the job done, not uh, how many years you've had in getting the job done. Great, great. Um, really good advice coming from uh, Angle there. And then um, directing this to Juma, um, Alana is asking, is it possible to be a developer and also have a life? Like um, if you're a person with diverse interests and hobbies, how can you still make it to be a decent developer? Yeah, I'd say it's possible. I actually have friends who are um, like very good engineers by day. And then uh, in their afterlife or whatever you call life, they'd be uh, maybe dancing. Um, actually, you know, two people do that a lot. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's a matter of time. It's a matter of um, just getting a balance about what you um want to do or the hobby that you are on the side. Uh, some people are not talented like me, people who can't dance, people can't do anything in their life. So I'd say uh, my hobby is just staring at the computer and writing stuff. It could be actually um, even uh, contributing to open source software. You could, you could call that a hobby. And then, um, I mean, that's not actual work. So that would mean like that you have a, a life outside work. Uh, but I'd say yeah, it's possible. Yeah, I mean, I've seen people who do that a lot. So yeah. Yeah, true. Programming, the programming world is very diverse in terms of, you know, the kind of talents and people that you can meet. So I definitely back you up. Um, so directing this to Rihanna, um, Alana is very curious, you know, do you, uh, did you have timelines to move to the next thing that you would, you know, like to achieve within your journey? Or was it all random? Oh, uh, I think it's more random and I settled goals or things that I would like in a short term 
depending on the on different situations. So I don't have like a timeline saying I want to go from here to here. I usually have a goal and I want to reach that goal. I work few um, hours times depending on what is uh, on 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 that. But uh, yeah, maybe I should. But <laughs> for me, for now, it's more of uh, um, aiming for something, trying to do that, and uh, trying to have other goals or. Uh, uh, plan B or whatever and uh, yeah I just go like this but uh, maybe it's good to have a timeline but for me it's sometimes it's a short term time uh, certain plan and sometimes it's long term but I just do some planning and based on uh, what I can do to access that goal and, and go on so yeah <laughs> Amazing, amazing. Uh, thanks a lot, Rihanna, for that. Um, you know, people have predefined paths. Others, you know, it comes, you know, by the day. So thanks a lot, Rihanna. Um, so I'll pose this as a last question. We have, you know, more, uh, but I believe we can have this as a last one and then head on to the parting shot. So directing this to Ango, um, Bios is asking, as a learner like me, whose first interaction with cloud engineering is GADS, how can I build my new career? Are there any available uh, internship opportunities for us to receive mentorship? Uh, I think instead of looking for internship, uh, you can in instead, uh, there are lots of cloud platforms that provide free tests or free resources. You can intend yourself, if, I, if that's a word, uh, by the, the, dipping more into a lot of the resources that are already available out there and using some of these free resources to experiment and learn and grow yourself. So that when that, coming back to what I said about being prepared for opportunities, so that when opportunities are passing by you, you are more prepared to grab them. So don't focus more on looking for internship, focus more in building yourself with the freely available resources so that when an opportunity comes, you might not need, when I first got my job, I was asking for an internship. Then I was asked, do you want an internship and a job? Who will go for the internship? Well, you go for the job. So that focus more on growing yourself. And when internship comes, you'll be prepared and probably can come to your job instead of an internship. Great, great. Um, thanks a lot, Abubakar, for that. I think um, we can actually add a few questions, uh, you know, before we get get on over to the parting shot. Uh, so directing this over to um, Juma Alan. So a question, uh, uh, Alana is asking, did you have pre-experience of Kotlin or Java before you went into ALC? Um, I left Android because of that to go for React Native for mobile. Yeah, um, before joining ALC, uh, I was actually, um, I was actually doing, I was actually, working as a consultant or more like a um, internship consultant uh, arrangement. And uh, there is an, me applying to ALC, like I mentioned earlier on, I actually did apply as a beginner. I applied as an intermediate. And for me, I was actually looking for, um, kind of like to improve my skills on what I had. I mean, based on what I had before. Uh, so for me, I feel like um, it really doesn't matter if you had pre previous experience or not if you're willing to learn then i think that's where you start off and then uh, i mean you keep on uh, learning from there so having um java experience or kotlin experience before i'd say that wasn't really uh, because i think when we're actually part of the lc you're actually learning in java and then after the lc program that's when i picked up kotlin and then i started learning kotlin on my own so pre that i didn't have any kotlin experience that was after but before then i had some java experience and then i built on top of that Amazing. Thanks a lot, Juma. Uh, I think I always love, you know, watching people do this whole uh, web versus uh, native Android type of, you know, debates. Uh, but yeah, there you have it from Juma Alan. You know, you can actually start off from Java and then, you Rihanna know. Rihanna is a, a flat GD, so I'll not talk today. Just, <laughs> just <too bad. laughs> we can definitely have a whole discussion. Uh, and Rihanna can definitely retaliate to that, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay, so um, heading over to the uh, to the next question, I will pose this to Ango. Since you talked um, about the fact that you started off from 
academia and then headed over to you know where you are right now um so you as an educator um and presently do you have time to actually assist and teach others teach others that are getting into you know this industry that you're in yes i am asynchronously uh, i think one of the ways people do the service to themselves is trying to get themselves in sync with who whoever they want to learn from uh, there's a term i coined asynchronous men mentorship where you uh, reach out to people who you want to learn from either by sending them dms and not putting too much expectation about replying them on time so i do have time if the person is willing to do it asynchronously, not necessarily have me in the right same time as them, I can't, I'm definitely open to helping. Yes, um, I can definitely attest, you know, our panelists are mentors actually actively in community. So yeah, you can definitely reach out to them, uh, ask them on anything that you would like. Um, interesting one, right? Um, so let me see, um, lots and lots of questions coming in. Um, now, um, this is one that maybe I'd like to get, um, uh, you know, just very quick feedback from each one of you. Someone is asking, um, do you need to have a high IQ to be good in tech? Or is it possible for just a band average IQ person to do well in tech? Uh, maybe we can start off with Rihanna and then um, Juma and then Ango. Well, it's a very hard question to answer. Yeah. Sorry, but <laughs> I don't think you need a really high IQ <laughs> for my experience. I mean, I did voluntary mentoring for um, for a person that, uh, I mean, for, uh, for uh, students uh, that didn't think they could be good enough to work in tech <laughs> and they made it and they are working so uh in general i don't i mean the thing that you need is to be consistent to practice as much as you can and that depends uh, i mean learning depends from each person uh, so you find your way to learn and you find a way to practice more as much as you can and um and be a teammate so in the uh, the thing it's, that is needed mostly, it's the problem solving. So once you have a lot of practice, that also really comes uh, uh, easy afterwards. So I don't, I don't believe you need a really high IQ to become, to work in tech. Uh, Juma? Um, yeah. So I'd support uh, Rihanna's argument here. I don't think you really need a high IQ um, because I think the only difference is how long it takes one person to learn a concept. And um, I mean, someone with a high IQ will be able to learn maybe faster than someone with a low IQ. So I really don't think it's a factor. So I'll give you an example about uh, myself. I don't think I have an high IQ. Um, so I used to be a um, IT student before I dropped off of uh, school. Uh, in my first year alone, I had six supplementaries. So I, I don't know if that's a high IQ person or mid-level or lower, but for me, I don't feel like uh, that uh, is, has been a barrier for me so far, uh, because I feel like once someone has the passion to learn, it doesn't, look, it doesn't matter how long it takes. Uh, if it takes you a week to learn this concept, then that's okay. Take a week to learn that. If it takes someone a day, then I mean, they have a high IQ and they're able to learn maybe faster than you. But that doesn't mean someone with a low IQ uh, is not a perfect fit to, uh, to join this tech industry. Okay, great. Uh, finally, Ango. Yeah, I think I will just base my answer on what Juma and Rihanna have said. They've summed it up uh, perfectly. The only thing I will add is consistency and perseverance. Being patient with yourself when you are actually failing is will make you achieve more even with someone that supposedly has a high IQ and they are not consistent and they don't have the perseverance to persist in uh, whatever tasks they are doing. Be patient with yourself and be consistent. Amazing, amazing. So, you know, it doesn't matter what your background was. 
um, you know, and it's never about the IQ. Then uh, in software development, it's a matter of if you can actually um, grasp the content and be able to implement the solutions. Um, so, um, and this is a very important one. Uh, something that, you know, um, is soft skills to so many people uh, and they would like to know that. Um, so again, hearing from each one of you, um, what guidance can you can um, would you have um, about salary negotiation um, during interviews, especially you know with these notable companies? What kind of advice would you give to people? Um, so with this one, I'll do reverse. I'll start with Ango, and then you and then Brianna. Yeah. I think um, it's more about doing your research and. Uh, trying as much as possible to learn more about the company, the role you're applying for and what is uh, obtainable uh, in that industry. Then the next thing is not selling yourself short. After doing your research, you already know, you already know your expectations, then you can put it forward. Worst case a company can do is to say, okay, we can't afford this and offer you what they can afford. But do your research and uh, don't sell yourself short. I think that's what I will uh, just add to this uh, conversation. Yeah, um, I still support Ango on that. I'd say, um, first of all, do your research. Um, so depending on the, I mean, the country or region that you're in, uh, there'll be like a very specific vague figure that you know, this is what a mid-level will get in any company. This is what a senior will get. And then now using that info, look at the company that you're applying for. Uh, playing out, sorry. So some companies would uh, actually probably say how much they pay for different roles. Uh, like in my company, they actually say how much they pay for a senior role, how much they pay for mid mid level role before you actually even apply for the job. So you know this is where I'm basing my argument from. And then uh, the other thing is uh, early on this year there was a thread about know your what. Most people actually go to post how much they earn, how much they're making in their current companies. I uh, actually did that. And I feel it's good for the community to just know um, how much someone is earning uh, for the same role, probably in a different company, they'll be able to value how much they're worth. Uh, so for me, when it comes to salary, I really like sharing with people how much I earn, just to give them a benchmark or an idea, or rather how much I used to earn in my previous roles. And then that will give them an argument and say, if this company is paying this for like this specific role, I'm able to negotiate for good pay because I feel like most engineers out there are actually underpaid and it's a big problem. And the only reason we can't cap that is most people would like to keep a secret how much they earn. So it's, it really doesn't help anyone or you just keeping it a secret. It, it actually helps someone uh, probably negotiate for a better offer. So um, even just in your networks, just asking how much people earn just to get an idea that's, that's something that you need to do before you consider um, probably giving a figure to a company. And uh, Ango said something very, uh, very key. Don't cut yourself short. So if you're looking for like say 300K and the company says you can't do that, just insist. And depending on how impressive you are saying like a technical interview, companies bend rules and it. So this person really uh, outshined during the technical interviews, you can actually raise the bar and just give him what he wants. So um, just be confident in yourself and don't go lower than what you feel is your worth. That's, that's something I came to learn um, when, I left my, when I left branch in March. I actually interviewed for four months until I got the perfect deal for me. So for me, I don't feel it's like a, just getting a job because I don't have any job. It's actually getting the right offer for you. And that's something that I really uh, personally like, um, uh, look up to or rather consider a lot because that's what gives you the satisfaction and that urge to actually work and deliver in that specific company because if every day you feel you're underpaid you don't have the motivation to work if it gets to 5 p.m you actually say i'm done with work and that's it so um never undercoat yourself and uh, just know your worth if you feel i'm worth this much then try and pursue that as well and then do your research as well Well, like a, but, uh, I mean, uh, Abu Bakr and Juma said most of the things that are needed when, while negotiating with, the, with companies. So I just want to add um, also negotiating in terms of your status, where you're going to reach with that company in a few years or in a few months, how uh, that company can help you grow 
is 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 important while uh, starting um, while the negotiation uh, uh, period. Uh, so uh, not all. I mean, do your research on the company and do your research also in terms of where the people that work in that company wished afterwards, that will help you understand also the, the quality uh, and, um, and if you are going to, um, uh, to work, it's gonna be like everyday thing. So if you have the chance to, to choose, try to understand in terms also of, the, um, of what that company can offer you in terms of your personal growth and the, uh, and the skills growth. So if they will pay for your, for example, for your courses or certifications or whatever, that's as much as important also on the salary negotiation and don't cut yourself. Definitely. That's most of the problems while trying to negotiate. So understand research, find out how, um, how much value proposed and also learn from the, while negotiating, learn from the companies where they will uh, make you reach in a few years, in a few months. So for everyone who has always been having, you know, issues with how am I supposed to negotiate and all. Um, so um, very amazing tips from our panelists. And I think with that, you know, given that, you know, that was a good end to most of the questions uh, that, you know, the learners had, uh, I think we'll now head on over to the parting shot. Uh, and for the parting shot, uh, in just a few seconds, um, what advice would you give someone who would like to expand their opportunities gap? Abu Bakr, uh, and then we'll head on over to Rihanna and finally Juma. Think as if the box does not exist. Don't limit yourself by other people's limitation. Focus more on uh, learning and growing yourself than being a celebrity developer on Twitter. And make sure you are persistent. Take feedback uh, seriously, but not personally. And don't compare yourself unnecessarily with people on Twitter. Thank you. I definitely uh, um, say don't compare yourself to others. Just compare uh, what, uh, how uh, your your versions. I mean, where where you were uh, six months ago, where you are now, and where you want to reach uh, uh, in few in few months or, or years, and um, go out from your comfort zone. Uh, see others, I mean, uh, be inspired by others, but at the same time, inspire yourself with the things that you are doing to grow yourself. Um, learn to grab opportunities and be ready for the opportunities. And um, yeah, mostly is um, see outside your comfort zone and uh, search as much as you can, what you can, um, where you can reach from outside your comfort zone. Yeah, for me, um, to add on to what uh, my co panelists have said. So the first thing I'd say is identify what it, what you want to learn. If it's Android, uh, decide on that. Number two, uh, either join a peer group or a community, or as, I mean, uh, a safe space that you feel that you can um, learn from and share your, uh, whether it's problems, whether it's ideas, suggestions with um, that safe space. And then uh, get a mentor. Uh, someone is uh, probably available to help you with uh, a few things along the way. So I'd say a mentor is, so if you're learning Android and you're studying today, a good mentor will be someone who's been doing it for around a year. Someone is available to help you if you're stuck and uh, all that. And then also have a role model, someone you look up to. Uh, it's not really copying that person, but um, someone who motivates you to probably learn and become a better version of yourself. That's it for me. I actually, at this point, don't have anything more to add because the amount of experience that you have in this panel, the people who are watching this is, you know, this is, these are the best of the best, you know, around. So um, a, a huge thanks to our panelists, Abu Bakr, um, Rihanna and Juma Alan for actually joining in on this session. We will be uh, sharing out, you know, um, their social media links so that you can be able to um, contact them whenever you need to, but also, you know, on your own, you can just Google them. You know, the thing about being a community contributor is, you know, if you ever Google your own name, there are a lot of 
results there. So you can just Google them at any time and connect them on different platforms. Um, and then um, to you as the learners for contributing in on our session. Thanks a lot. We had so many questions. Um, if we had more time, we'll definitely be able to relay them. Uh, but for now, you know, um, the session has been very interesting. And um, yeah, we have a lot more coming up. Uh, for now, I'd like to hand it over to Joy and Marcy um, to actually run the next session. So thanks a lot, everyone, for joining in on the panel session.